Hey everybody, Luke Thompson, the Chief Operating Officer of ActionVFX.com here. Uh, really excited about today's episode. Today I'm joined with our founder and CEO, Rodolphe Pierre-Louis, otherwise known as Ro. What's up, Ro? Hey, how's it going, man? Good. Super excited about today's episode. Uh, yeah, like this podcast has been something we've wanted to get up and running for quite a while. Um, so it's actually happening. It's for real this time. Yeah, it's been my lifelong dream of being a guest on an action vfx podcast so thank you for having me and inviting me this is a true honor i'm so excited to yeah just talk about all the behind the scenes details and the scoops you can get anywhere else the inside scoops yeah uh this platform is going to be you know serving a lot of purposes uh, but one of those is we you know our team is actually going to be able to dig into a lot of other uh, industry-related topics. We're going to have a wide number of guests that I'm really excited about. Um, but also, we're going to be able to dig in deeper and share some more stories about Action VFX, about company history. That's what we'll get into more today. Um, but without this platform, we wouldn't be able to do that anywhere else. You know, it's like who's who's asking us about all of these crazy war stories uh, that we have <laughs> of production. So, really excited about today's episode. So, let's do it. So the format of this show uh, is really going to be centered around uh, one question each episode. Um, so they're not going to be you know, super long, drawn out, kind of just hanging out conversations. They're going to be very focused um, on specific topics. You know, Maybe it's about a certain technology, um, industry topic, whatever. So today with our guest, Rodolphe Pierre-Louis, a.k.a. Ro, the founder and CEO of Action VFX, the question for him is going to be, why Action VFX? So, Ro. Why Action VFX? I feel like this definitely would be a very long question to answer. There is a lot to go there. But if I were to summarize everything, I would say the biggest reason for Action VFX is at the time we were launching, I truly believed that was what the industry needed at Mm -hmm. the time. Because, you know, visual effects stock footage was nothing new. But the way it was being done, I really felt we could do that, not just better, but the way we could deliver the assets to our audience could really make their lives a lot easier. So at the end of the day, if I just, yeah, one sentence, I would say action VFX, because that's what the industry needed. So kind of pulling out of that row, um, can you kind of explain a little a little bit build up? I know we've explained it quite a bit in the past, um, but as far as like, the company pre-action VFX. I know mm-hmm. we talk a lot about like our Kickstarter period, you know, crowdfunding and how exciting all of that was. And we will touch on that a little bit, but really paint us a picture of what that was looking like mm-hmm. beforehand. Like, did you just wake up one day after you saw the same crappy explosions and you're <laughs> like, you know, forget this. I'm, I'm on it. Um, how, what did that look like? Yeah. It's like my journey to getting to action VFX really started a lot longer than most people realize. I think it was around 2007, and I would have been uh, 14, 14 at the time, 14, 15, when, you know, like I really attempted to make my very first uh, VFX elements pack. I remember I went to Walmart, I bought some red balloons, bought some corn syrup and food coloring, and bought like a white, white foam board and i thought hey you know i'm going to start making bloodstock footage because you know i've always been very entrepreneurial in that sense and ever since being introduced to visual effects the idea of you know compositing real assets you know it's always been mind-blowing so in Mm -hmm. 2007 that's when i've had my first attempt as a 14 15 year old trying this thing out and obviously it didn't work because (laughs) Yeah, like it. It was it was a big uh, failure in that sense, but not really because I got to you know flex those muscles a bit and mm-hmm. experiment with that. You know when you know the journey that I am now, I would say officially started would be in 2011. I remember one summer the software hit film had just been released, and I felt that was a great opportunity to be someone that like the first person to do tutorials for a hit film, because obviously After Effects 
there were already millions of After mm -hmm. Effects tutorials out there and I felt, okay, let's do hit film. You know, this thing is brand new. Let me spend the time and learn it and, and actually create content. So I started doing that and I had a YouTube channel called Rody Polis and it, yeah, I was the first official third party person creating hit film tutorials and started growing the audience from there. Mm -hmm. And eventually, Rody Polis, the YouTube channel, became RodyPolis.com, where it was sort of like a blog slash um, training channel at first. But of course, the entrepreneur in me felt, hey, okay, there is an audience there and they are following all the visual effects stuff. What can we sell? You yeah. know, what, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. what could I, what need could I fill with this platform and this audience that I had? So in 2011, I think it was in November 2011, I released the very first stock footage, you know, VFX elements pack, which was called Shootout Stock Pack. And it was all digitally created. And so, yeah, that's, that's literally the first product that went out. It was selling for $15 for the whole pack when it was released and started getting some good traction from there. And mm -hmm. it felt like, okay, there is a viable way to use this Rudy Polis website and the YouTube channel to make a living. Cause yeah. back then I was mainly freelancing, doing music videos mostly. So. Yeah, one product led to another product and then it just kept on going and the Rudy Polis website just started growing, started building the audience and went on and did that until around 2015, which is when the transition to action VFX started taking place. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. And I okay, so one question kind of like going back to your, mm -hmm. you know, entrepreneurial journey you know you said about like you were 14 years old when you tried your first vfx stock thing at that point had you already kind of connected like this could be a career path or was it kind of just like hey maybe i could make some money on the side if i'm able to make these tools for other people yeah it's like I don't think at that time, especially when I was 14, I was really even thinking about building anything that would make a living. I don't know mm -hmm. how much I was thinking about making a living back then, but it was, I always just love the idea of doing something yourself. And it's like, you can do it, so go out and do it. You know, mm -hmm. that's how I approached any of those, you know, um, projects I would do in middle school and high school. Hey, I have an idea for a short film. Let's get some friends together and actually try to make this thing. So at mm -hmm. first, that was definitely where it was going. I would say when I really started saying, okay, this could actually be a real thing, I would say would be around maybe a month after releasing Shootout Stock Pack, which again, it was $15. I think I was mm -hmm. averaging maybe three sales a day when that first launched. So it wasn't any crazy money that, okay, I'm gonna make a living off of this. But yeah. that's when I started seeing the potential and the need that people had and realized that, okay, I can actually, you know, if I spend my time and make these assets, they will actually help people and they will mm -hmm. use them in their own projects. So I would say that's when it really started. And then obviously, as more time goes by, the more the vision evolves because mm -hmm. what Action VFX is now, back in 2011, 2012, heck, I would say 2013, I definitely did not have that vision yet. You know, never in my wildest dream would I think we're going to build this thing we have mm -hmm. done. So, yeah, that's awesome. So, kind of like continuing with that timeline, you know, it's like kind of 2011, 2013. Mm -hmm. um, did that go straight from that time period to, you know, 2015, you kind of picked mm -hmm. up and was just like, Hey, I'm going to do this thing again, kind of in that middle period right there. Like what, what went on during that time? Uh, did you try to do anything on the side? Mm -hmm. Was it more of just focusing on like your filmmaking career, music videos, that kind of stuff? Uh, what kind of take pl takes place mm -hmm. in that gap? I think it was around 2013, yeah, it was around 2013 when I fully decided, okay, I'm done freelancing. Because to me, freelancing was always mainly about the money. 
because at the end of the day I want to make movies and tell mm -hmm. stories and music videos are great they're fun they allow you to be very creative I did a few commercials too that was always fun but at the end of the day as soon as I didn't need that money anymore I kind of dropped those and decided okay I'm going to focus on rodipolis.com and the plan is going to be to keep growing the audience, keep making great content, and also keep making great products. So mm -hmm. we had shootout stock pack, had a shootout audio pack, had different lens flare, light leaks type products, some ink products, you know, for motion graphics. So that was kind of the the vision. In the back of my mind, of course, explosions and fire and all of these exciting stuff, that was always there because that was the next step Mm -hmm. right because you know anybody well most people can do a, a light leak most people yeah. can do lens flares most people can do ink but to actually do a real life explosion that was going to be something different so i had some attempts to do that throughout those years and unfortunately they didn't work i think the closest i got was you know i found this guy i was living in miami at the time and i found this guy and I remember he he did some stuff for some you know TV shows I would have heard of, and thought, okay, this this dude is legit. He's going to be the guy that I will hire to do this pack. And then I remember after I sent out my down payment, you know, my fifty percent upfront down payment, the guy ran essentially, and you know that was definitely that hurts. You, know, you you learn a lot through these things, but. And that was a good lesson to make me realize that, hey, the world isn't all sunshine and rainbows, <laughs> yeah, right? You know, people, people suck sometimes, and that's just part of it. So I never got uh, my money back, and that was around the time when I moved from, was transitioning from moving in Florida to moving mm -hmm. to Tennessee, where I am now. So, yeah. so I was like, okay, you know what? <laughs> lessons learned let's let's just keep moving forward because yeah it will work out eventually nice and were you like after that period though like what was going through your head because i i would imagine it goes one of two ways you know one i know you so this is easy for me <laughs> it goes one of two ways and it's either like all right i'm done like you know what's the point like i don't even want to bother with mm -hmm. this thing just literally lost all this money or the other direction is like that just fuels the fire even more mm -hmm. for like why this needs to be a thing so yeah. what which direction did you take i i gave up and and just never looked back <laughs> loaded question we're sitting here right now loaded question <laughs> yeah it's uh i think one thing that i'm lucky that i have been born with and i say born with because i don't feel like i put in any effort in it is I'm usually pretty persistent and I can sit that with video games and things too. You know, I can lose 20 times and still play that 21st time. So that's why I've been getting so good at Beat Saber. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you're not so, competitive at all, right? That's like... uh, No, I, I, I don't <laughs> like competition that much. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's like it was in that moment, it was one of those things, as I said, I felt, okay, it happened what lessons can I learn from this? And I think mm -hmm. the one of the biggest uh, business lessons which we've, we've talked about that I got from this is you'll never be so desperate to make something happen that you're not looking for any red flags because there are definitely red flags that I could have mm -hmm. seen if I wasn't so, oh, like this thing needs to happen. We need explosions yeah. and things. So, But in the end, you learn from it and you move on and... I would say a couple of years went by before, you know, started working on action VFX. I mean, well, it wasn't even action VFX yet. A couple of years yeah. went by before I attempted to do another explosion shoot. But like I knew it was always going to happen because it seemed like the next progression of where mm -hmm. Rody Polis was. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, again, we're just like working our way down this timeline at this point. So Moving over, going into 2015, um, that was about the time that uh, Ro and I met. So there was a local After Effects meetup group um, happening in our small town of East Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And 
not having a big, you know, like a VFX community at the time, like it's it's grown a lot over the past five or six years that, you know, Ro and I have been working together. Um, but that was like mainly, you know, motion graphics focused mm-hmm. people, but it was still like, hey, an After Effects user group. This is a gold mine because there are no like-minded people when it comes to this program. You know, mm-hmm. most people just look at it and are like, ah, this is too complicated. Like, I want to do something else. Um, so it was really cool to kind of see this event pop up that was, you know, community-led, community-driven. And it also facilitated, like, our introduction. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think I'll always hold that really high. Um, and even when that comes to other meetups that we have, you know, in the area or in the industry, um, I can never, like, emphasize enough the importance of knowing people, you know, making a good first impression mm-hmm. um, and being known for, like, high-quality standards. Like, that's just – it speaks for itself. Yeah. Um, and everyone listening already knows those things, but I think it's good to be reminded. And so Ro and I got connected at this uh, meetup and I don't know, what, a couple months, maybe a couple months went by. We really didn't get to talk too much there. Uh, mm-hmm. There were about eight, maybe definitely less than ten people there. So it was a pretty small group. Um, but we chatted just very briefly. You know, he kind of talked about some music video stuff uh, that he'd done. I had done freelance videography at the time. So it was like, cool, you know, cool guy to know, stay in touch with. And then uh, we got connected on Facebook as things always happen. And he posts, hey, I'm looking for a behind the scenes videographer for this thing in Chicago, you know, kind of cryptic. <laughs> I talked I talked to my wife. I'm like, hey, I don't know this guy. Um, but he opened up his van and says, I have cameras. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to my wife, I, I, I can't say no. You know, it's like this, <laughs> this, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds it's always funny how creepy it sounds uh, um but it's also funny how far reality is like it's not too far away like it mm-hmm. it sounds creepy it kind of was creepy you're gonna film explosions in chicago with a guy you've never met for a week <laughs> all right like something something sketchy may be going on here so <laughs> thankfully um uh, my employer at the time was very gracious to allow me you know that time off um, and my wife is very gracious. We've just gotten married to allow that time to uh, really grow and just work. And like, I do was... remember when I, when you said, "Hey, I need to ask my wife," and my first thought was, "Oh, he's gonna, he's gonna bail on it. <laughs> there is no way someone who has a wife, like the wife, is not gonna let him just <laughs> just travel with a stranger." Yeah, you're know, like this eight, guy doesn't nine even hours know me. <laughs> driving to Chicago to go blow things up. Yep. So it happened. She said yes. Uh, she was super cool about it. But also, like, I think it was important for me to to connect those dots with her as well of, you know, because even just talking with you, your vision so early on was so contagious for this thing you wanted to build. And it wasn't just even really early on, it was kind of focused on being a pack or a set of clips mm-hmm. that evolved over into the website or the platform of what it is now. But even like hearing you talk about really early conceptual stages of these are like the assets to end all assets, which (laughs) obviously progresses into what we have now of like our platform and just constantly pushing ourselves to be the best and be the most innovative um, in our industry for, you know, the products that we offer. Like that was extremely contagious. And so that week we went to Chicago, we filmed some stuff. Um yeah pick up there bro like how did that shoot go what was the game plan coming out of that yeah yeah so so it was august 2015 me luke and another friend of mine were in this van driving to chicago to go blow things up we got connected with some guys that worked on transformers 3 over there when they were shooting in chicago so it was like okay they they know the explosion stuff so we'll focus on you know the film and visual effects and capturing the assets right sort of things and and yeah like i would say going in that shoot i felt like i overplanned but that was one of those uh situations where you don't know what you don't know until you get there and you realize yeah. okay we didn't plan at all 
and it was definitely harder to plan a project being in Tennessee and then coordinating with people in mm -hmm. Chicago. So the shoot honestly was not a success. I could not say it was a success at all. You know, like <laughs> I could say it was a failure if it wasn't for the fact that we had behind the scenes footage from the shoot, which, hey, <laughs> shout out to Luke Thompson. <laughs> he, he did. Oh, the my job. gosh. I'm glad it worked. <laughs> he did the job he, he was brought on to do. So, so yeah, the shoot didn't go well at all. And with my quality standards, I realized that I had a choice to make. I could either sell what we got. And honestly, I could have gotten out. Like, I could have sold them. Yeah. It wouldn't be anything groundbreaking. It wouldn't be good by any means. But, like, I could have sold them and made some money off of it. But I remember coming from that trip. And it's like, that's kind of like when you and I just weren't as deep into the project you know because mm -hmm. it's like at the time you're mainly doing the bts stuff which is good but i remember driving back and really just thinking like do we have enough do i have enough to make something out of this and i think yeah basically all Rody paula's savings <laughs> was spent on this like mm -hmm. i wasn't gonna go homeless because i still had personal savings but as far as like the company savings yeah it all went into the shoot because it was going to be the thing. It was going to be the thing that puts Rudy Polis on the map. And yeah, that wasn't going to happen. And that felt terrible. The pressure was intense. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was a choice to make. What's next? Do I just sell these and try to make some money back? Or do I keep on trying? And eventually decided to do a Kickstarter campaign because it was like, okay, I've learned from the mistakes from that shoot, so we can do it again, but I have no money. And I feel like this thing is going to cost way more than originally mm -hmm. thought of, because I think yeah. that Chicago shoot spent about $11,000 on it total, which, you know, at the time was, well, not at the time, that's still a lot of money. Still a lot of money. To something yeah. and have it not work out. So, yeah. so that's when the idea for the Kickstarter came on. I remember a few years before FX Home actually did a Kickstarter. And so that kind of was like, okay, it is possible to do a Kickstarter mm -hmm. campaign for a software or for an idea like that for visual effects and just have the people that would want it actually support the project. So that's when the idea for the Kickstarter came and went on there, started working on that. And thankfully, we had be behind the scenes video so we had behind the scenes video and we had just enough from what we shot to show people that okay this is not just a pipe dream mm -hmm. but i mean honestly it probably felt like we had things together more than we did in the video of course <laughs> i don't think anyone could watch that video and think oh yeah like this guy totally just blew all his company savings on a failed shoot <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I believed in it and we had enough to really show people that hey we are actually trying to do this and we are listening to the users we did you know the surveys to learn from professional VFX artists and amateur VFX artists just anyone what they actually want mm -hmm. in visual effects assets so I yeah. think we're able to communicate that well in the video and you know I think that's what made people feel okay we can trust these guys to deliver on this project that they're actually trying to do mm -hmm. yeah and i i was always so impressed like when i first stepped in uh you know more in like the project management type of uh arena really just keeping stuff organized and mm -hmm. you know saying hey how can we progress this um I was always super impressed at like your level of organization at the time when it came to planning everything out. Uh, you know, you mentioned feeling like you'd over planned when we went to that Chicago shoot. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I remember getting a binder uh, that said like, hey, this is the amount of stuff. And when I looked through on the way, of course, I was, I mean, you know, like a 10 hour drive each way. You got plenty <laughs> of time to think. And we got to know each other super well. Yeah. But. I remember thinking like, is this 
a real thing that we're actually going to be able to like get through <laughs> this amount of stuff because there was just so many different effects. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, kind of transitioning into the January shoot um, that we can go ahead and kind of discuss a little bit mm-hmm. too post Kickstarter. You know, we've been able to listen to all of, of those user surveys, really craft a campaign um, around that really, yeah, just listening to what do people want mm-hmm. instead of telling them what they want. And then, oh man, that was such a good feeling. Extremely nervous. I know you were in a much stressful, a much more stressful uh, seat than I was for that. Um, I still had a, a full time real job, quote unquote, <laughs> at the time. And just, you know, kind of working during the day, working with you at night, trying to build stuff, keep things moving. Um, it was. Yeah, like it was great, and it was really exciting, although you know extremely stressful. Mm-hmm. And then we finally completed the campaign. Uh, we raised fifty nine thousand in thirty days, uh, whereas our real original goal was twenty k, um, which was just awesome to see. Like kind of blasting through that lid, seeing it's not just us. Mm-hmm. I think that's the feeling that I got too. Of like, because your vision was so contagious, it was like, man, I really hope that people are able to kind of like put their money where their mouth is when it comes to like, we're wanting to build this, but we can't do it without them. Yeah. Um, and so seeing 446 backers do that and come out and just say, Hey, we're going to support this project. Um, and even like seeing the cool relationships that have come out of that. Uh, like, I feel like I just have a lot of really good friends that originally backed our Kickstarter mm-hmm. and then it's just progressed of like, Hey, cool. You do cool stuff. Hey, yeah. cool. It's always the craziest thing when, you know, like Chris from Crafty Apes, for example, when mm-hmm. I finally met him years later and then he was talking and it's like, yeah, back to your Kickstarter. And it's like, whoa. Yeah. And like it's always, you know, I keep meeting people that you wouldn't think would be backing the Kickstarter, yeah. working at this big companies at a higher level. And it was, yeah, it's always really cool to hear that even from the beginning people really just believed in what we were trying to do yeah and even uh you know like alan mckay is another one of Mm -hmm. our backers that just the nature of the work that he does he doesn't even need (laughs) to be stuck and so like that just i think that escalates how much that means to me and like us as a company of yeah it's one thing when someone can use this stuff but it's Mm -hmm. another one when it's like man i really appreciate that because again they it it connected with them when it comes to what we're trying to build what we're trying to do um so extremely appreciative for those 446 users every time i see them i tell them i love them yep and if you're an action vfx forum user and you backed our kickstarter be sure to dm me because we have a special badge when i put on your profile picture just to let everybody know that you're a real one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that you were, I was one of the 446. Yep. Nice. Cool. So kind of, again, pulling, you know, discussed Kickstarter a little bit, branching out of that Kickstarter, you know, we had 59K to blow, right? Mm. It's like <laughs> <laughs> the immense level of pressure and responsibility to those backers mm-hmm. coming out of that campaign. What's going through your mind at the time? How does that kind of, transition into the big shoot Mm -hmm. that we (laughs) refer to of january 2016 um yeah like what what were you thinking in a good way (laughs) that sounded that sounded like what were you you thinking well i was like is it now is it time to run (laughs) (laughs) just like that pyrotechnics guy i Uh, learned just that's the lesson i got from (laughs) from that experience you can't run Uh, no, it was, I mean, the pressure was intense. There was a lot, you know, there was so much that I could really unpack in a one hour mm-hmm. podcast, right? Because one, there was the fact that this was, a, this was definitely the most amount of money I have ever had to handle at once, you yeah. know, at one time, like being able to go to the bank account and it's actually $53,000, it's there. Mm-hmm. It is waiting to be used. So of course that was you know, pressure as far as a entrepreneur, like business standpoint, but also just the, you know, the Kickstarter 
when it succeeds and it ends and you're like, yes, you know, we raised it. I think maybe I had one night where I felt like a winner because you wake up the next morning and it's like, okay, now it's time to mm. deliver. To actually do and, it, yeah. Yeah, and you always hear me say about how much, you know, the Kickstarter I felt is the hardest thing I've ever done because it was the thing that took the most out of me. I have the stories of being paralyzed <laughs> in my bed once, like I couldn't wake up just due to the stress and stuff. So it was essentially, okay, that happens and we won, we did the thing. Mm -hmm. And then right after that, okay, the products need to actually happen. So I think I had a good trip because I'm originally from Haiti. So I had a good trip back to Haiti, visited my parents and yeah, that would have been the first time I went back to Haiti since I moved to the U.S. since 2005. So that was literally like 10 years later. Mm -hmm. I think that trip really helped me not only get out of the environment to relax a bit and go back to my roots and put a lot of things in perspective because that definitely contributed a lot to me being able to come back and, you know, just hit the floor running yeah because i think i got back in the states january 2nd 2016 and it was just okay this is all i'm doing until this thing is successful mm -hmm. and the january shoot happened which it definitely was a lot better than the chicago shoot we ended up doing it in tennessee so we had the guys from chicago actually be the ones that came down to Tennessee this time, which mm -hmm. helped a ton because it's hard to go and drive and plan something. And yeah, that shoot, I would say, is the hardest action VFX shoot ever. One, because pressure's on the line. You have to deliver on the products. Mm -hmm. You have 446 people expecting something. So that was huge. It was also, we shot a lot outside and it was so cold. Uh, it was the coldest. Yeah, I, I don't know that I've ever been that cold again. Um, I, I think the Honestly. the wind chill was right at zero degrees, and so any time an explosion would go off, it's like ooh. <laughs> yeah, you could feel uh, oh, the man, warmth of again. the explosion yeah. for a brief second. Yeah, yeah. It that <laughs> shoot was rough, and but nah, we pulled through. We had some hiccups, as all things happen, and I mean we don't need to really get too deep into that but things happened well enough to where we could consider the january shoot to be a success and then i think we ended up doing another shoot in march just to pick up some stuff that we weren't able to do in the january mm -hmm. shoot and and yeah <laughs> so so that's nice. kind of the journey then it was you know launching the website yeah. So I did have one uh, fun fact as well. I think the last time I checked, and Ro, correct me on this if I'm wrong, uh, the last time I checked on the website, we had had uh, only three products from our initial Chicago shoot, three products being three video clips that actually made it on the website past quality control. Is that yep. right? Yep. We had three fireballs, like three fireball clips. So not even collections, but literally three clips yeah. from the Chicago shoot that ended up making it on the website. Yep. Insane. And I think that alone, like, again, that that's not s s something that people hear or, like, mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of uh, channels to, like, you know, just chat and talk about this. Yeah. But that's one of those things that I think really, really speaks very highly to our quality standards. And it's easier to see, you know, as time goes on, it's like, you know, we may be just the percentages of clips that we actually keep from mm -hmm. a shoot is absurd. Like our quality standards are ridiculous, but that's good. And that's yeah. how we've been able to kind of curate our library in a way that, you know, meets that need of the professional artist in mind. And it's not, um, you know, we always say like, we're never going to be the guys that are like, Hey, you can pay 20 bucks and have 500,000 <laughs> clips that are going to be trash and you're going to just really waste your time that's already super valuable searching through a garbage pile. So yep. we're never going to be those guys. <laughs> um, 
And it's always just emphasizing the quality over quantity, but at the same time, being able to have variety in there, I Mm -hmm. think is really important Um, and just continues to speak to, you know, as we go. So coming up on our timeline, you know, January 2016, kind of pushing through, uh, I'll blast through just a little bit, kind of get more present day. Uh, 2017, you know, we had a five week shoot that was insane. Uh, Would not recommend anyone doing a five week straight VFX plate shoot. (laughs) <laughs> it was mad. Um, I think we're you, still releasing products from that shoot up until 2020 or some crazy thing like that. Yeah. How was it 2019? I just know it, it took years for us to even edit through everything. Yeah, it it really did. And that was because, you know, like we had equipment rented, you know, so we had a couple of different uh, red cameras at the time. <laughs> and just the amount of stuff that we packed in, it's almost like I reference back to that binder in the very first shoot that I got, which I still have. I need to, like, frame it somewhere. I did keep that. <laughs> I will. I reference back to that in my mind, and it's like, holy crap. Like, we actually got this. <laughs> we <laughs> we got actually did it. <laughs> we got the binder. Like, we, we got, you know. And, of course, like, it's not everything that we had wanted, but we were able to, like, work through and get so much stuff, like, in that 2017 shoot, we we filmed so much stuff. A lot of it, you know, didn't make it to the website because of quality standards and all of that. But we also, another fun fact, um, built two swimming pools that were uh, 30 feet mm-hmm. in circumference. I don't know. Uh, first one, we put it up, filled it up. It exploded. <laughs> so we came in the next day ready to shoot to a really wet area outside um, and, and everything. It literally exploded too because you could see things move back so far away from where they were before. Yeah. I don't even know what happened. Yep. So from that moment, because we thought, hey, it's a used pool. Like, we'll just buy it used, put it up because we're going to blow it up anyway. Um, but there is a threshold for <laughs> 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 should have just went and bought a new one. Um, out of that, we went to Walmart, said, give us your largest pool. We're going to blow it up. And then they escorted us to the car. <laughs> Just kidding. That was a joke. So we finally get that back, you know, and then we do some of that large scale water stuff that we have on the website. Um, in that 2017 shoot, so much stuff, dust explosions, large scale gas explosions, uh, volume two. We had that was intense. Like that was a, another five week stretch that was just really, really hard. Um, but I think pushed us and grew us in a lot of really great ways as a company. Mm-hmm. Um, so barreling through kind of up to present day, skipping over a couple of shoots. Um, where are we at right now? Ro, with our library, um, as things sit, you know, what, what do you think, I guess, how do you feel about where our library is currently Mm -hmm. Um, right now? I think we're just shy of 4,000 individual assets um, somewhere in the ballpark. We're over that now. Okay. Crowd, crowd effects blasted us past that. We're over that that now. Yeah. So I think we're almost, I would say we're around the 4,500 mark at at this moment. Yeah. Because crowds was 660 clips in and of itself. So that was massive uh, and broke my numbers. So yeah, pushing up right in there, where do you feel uh, about our library as far as mm-hmm. where it's at, where it's headed, some of the new plans that we've had, uh, some of the new kind of like pricing structures and mm-hmm. things like that? Um, how do you how do you feel like where we're at versus where we're going? Yeah, like so it's like the, you know, plan, you know, the vision of Action VFX from the beginning, you know, has always been to build the largest and best library of visual effects assets. So that's always been the the goal, you know, and, you know, biggest as far as not just quantity over quality, but mm-hmm. it's kind of like quality and quantity as far as having variation to things because the, you know, another answer to why action VFX is we really didn't have that much variety in the industry and, you know, people could easily recognize, oh, this is from, you know, this pack. Oh, this is from that pack. Oh, I've Mm -hmm. seen that explosion. I've seen that muzzle flash many times. And, you know, a mindset for us has always, we want to have so much that we can 
essentially compete against ourselves. Mm -hmm. So you could use one, you know, clip from Gas Explosions Volume 1, which I think was about 40 clips in that. But then we still have Gas Explosions Volume 2, and then we still have Large Scale Gas Explosions. So it's like, these are all those different collections. So it's like right now at around 4,500, we'll have to check the exact number of assets that we have. I feel that we have accomplished a lot of our goals in the sense that we have built the foundation. Mm -hmm. You know, we action VFX, and this is me trying to not necessarily toot, you know, our own horn here, but many people do consider it to be the place to get visual effects assets if you mm -hmm. want something high quality, if you want something that will get the job done. So I feel like we've succeeded in establishing the foundation and now we're at the point of okay it's been five years well well we'll have our five-year anniversary very soon and it's kind of like how do we build on top of that foundation to take it to the next level mm -hmm. so obviously plans that we have is one keep growing the quantity because as much of like as much elements that action vfx has right now we can't say we have everything and it's like and that that's even a crazy idea right could we be the place that literally you think of one thing that you could use for mm -hmm. visual effects and have us have it it doesn't have to be some crazy big thing for example cigarette smoke hey do you want lingering smoke from a cigarette that will be something that we will get. You know, that's not something that's necessarily mind blowing, but we really do take it seriously to be that place that, hey, yeah. you're making a project, you will get what you need. So we're doing a lot of that. But then there's different types of assets. Obviously our bread and butter right now is 2D elements, but what about 3D elements? That's something that could definitely, and that has been requested a ton mm -hmm. by our users. You know, can we use the same quality control that we already use to branch into something like that? So these are things that we are keeping in mind and working towards to make sure they happen. And then there's also just the fact that we want to serve the community as best as we can and this is kind of what goes through subscription, for example. You know, with subscriptions, we never want to get to a place where we're only a subscription company because there is a great freedom in the current system that we have now. And you pick what you want. You want just one clip. You can literally mm -hmm. get just that. But, you know, the subscription and why it made sense is because we can benefit a lot more people while not lowering what we stand for mm -hmm. through a subscription. So these are things that, you know, we're adding to the vision, we're evolving in that sense, but still keeping the core of what we actually want to do with Action VFX. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, even the subscription model to like adding that on instead of like, Hey, we're doing this or that, mm -hmm. as you said, I think continues to just provide more options for people, for artists. And, you know, obviously like the value is going to be there. So if you're a regular user anyway, like it's really going to incentivize you mm -hmm. and make sense, um, you know, cause yeah, there's just a lot to love about that. And I think that's only going to continue to lower the bar of entry for people. Um, as you said, without reducing, you know, obviously we also have a good amount of overhead when it comes to like the size files that we transfer and all mm -hmm. of that. Like there's a lot of cost when it comes into developmentally and our infrastructure to support opening XR files uh, that are hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes for yep. a, a grouping of clips. So trying to like weigh all of that, you know, understand, Hey, this is reality. Like that we do have these costs but how can we provide those in a way to everyone as you know as many people as we can mm -hmm. um while it still makes sense for us to like be able to move and operate yeah. as a business 
Um, so I think that's, you know, a tension that we'll always kind of work through um, as new things come, you know, whether that's 3D things, obviously we get into file sizes and what's best for what type of specialization and mm-hmm. all of that. Um, but I've always appreciated that as a company as well for, you know, that's not just a you thing. That's not just a me thing. That's everyone here really shares that same mindset of the community how can we continue to give back whether that's like free products or anything that we uh, can do differently with products going forward Mm -hmm. whether that's adjusting color spaces or any Mm -hmm. you know like really technical stuff that could be shifted or slanted slightly and maybe it's more work on our end for post-production but that's not something that we really mind you know it's like shout out to zach van hoy for being the technical guru at yes. the office <laughs> yes major yeah, shout definitely out. helped take uh action vfx products as far as technical accuracy mm-hmm. <laughs> on a level that i will happily admit that i wouldn't have been able to just due to we all have our strengths and focuses and yeah like so zach if you're watching this you're awesome man or listening to on your respective podcasting platform whether that's apple facebook now spotify Mm. all of the above shameless plug for the (laughs) ask an artist action vfx podcast so ro kind of wrapping up here uh what would you say is next in the realm of action vfx when it comes to i mean we've obviously touched a little bit on the subscription model Mm. like that but like let's say five years like bigger vision anything i know we have some like super secret plans that we're gonna Mm. always hold to our chest and take to our graves but outside of that is there anything that like you can share that comes Mm. to how can we continue to change up the industry with what we offer yeah um we definitely do have some stuff that we're working on that can't really say too much about but i would say the best way i can answer this question and give people a good idea of what I mean without, you know, spoiling anything, you know, it has to do with the, you know, vision statement for 2021, you know, that goes something like, and I'm butchering, (laughs) I'm going to butcher it because I don't remember the exact wording, but essentially our aim is to be the one common link for every compositor's career. And it's like when you make a claim this bold, Mm -hmm there's a lot that can come from it. And, you know, over the years, we've had the chance, like we've known who we are, but then after five years, you can really, you know, understand, okay, here is where we fit in, here is our sweet spot, and here is, you know, what we want to do in the industry. And mm-hmm. and at the end of the day, you know, Action VFX is a company that helps compositors. That's what it was founded as. But currently, how do we help compositors? Well, we do 2D VFX assets. We do tutorials. We, you know, provide training. We have a blog where we write some great articles. We have a forum now. You know, this is directly um, related through that vision Mm -hmm. because, you know, when you have a forum and you have a community where users from all over the world whether you're just starting out or you just worked on the Avengers, you can come and communicate. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's like forums and online communities for me, that has been something that's so huge in my growth and career over the years. And I just, I am so thankful to be able to actually, you know, in turn provide that same type of community for our users. Mm -hmm. So, so to summarize, I would say, yeah, we want to keep, being that one common factor where every compositor no matter what stage of your career that you're in there will be something action vfx is doing that is going to hopefully make your career better that's going Mm -hmm. to help you do something like make your life easier in one shape or form so so yeah and is that gonna be limited to just 2d elements for our products of course not Ooh, of course not i like it there there's a lot you can do for yeah for compositors that don't involve you know 2d stock footage so Mm -hmm. so that's that's what i would say with that question 
Nice. Yeah, and it's cool having that, you know, be our mission out of that, like the, the overflow of that mission really doesn't limit us, you know, unless we let it. Mm-hmm. Say, hey, well, how do we do this for how do we be that common thread between every compositor's career, whether starting out or you know, even towards retirement? It's not a very limiting statement, mm-hmm. and that's why I really like it. I feel like it's really ambitious and is always going to be pushing us to stay with the industry itself. Mm-hmm. You know, if the industry goes right, everybody starts working this certain way, like we're going to have tools in that lane mm-hmm. to help artists with that. Um, and not just any artists, VFX compositors yeah. and, you know, people working on effects and stuff. So it's really cool to kind of um, be able to start, you know, making those smaller investments now in these adjacent lanes that, hey, if the industry does turn left, turn right, uh, we're going to be there to provide those tools um, when the industry's there. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like trying to see where somebody's going to be when you, you know, you're passing a ball. It's like you don't throw <laughs> it to where they're at when you see them. You throw it to where they're going to be. Um, so I think a lot of that can be said, too, about the products that we're trying to make and the quality standards with mm-hmm. things that don't necessarily exist yet. And I'm sure some of them will just not even be used because mm-hmm. that's just how it works. Um, but all in all, like I think it's really exciting to see um, all of the different things we have going on, even the things we can't talk about. Um, but a lot that we can, like the subscription, continuing to build our library. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening here. And at the end of the day, like it's only going to benefit VFX artists and compositors and supervisors and um, everyone as a whole. So at the end of the day, if we can save people time in their work, that's a win for us. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember uh, last year we had visited uh, Crafty Apes Atlanta location. I was speaking with one of the VFX supervisors <laughs> and man, he, he says, he sat down and he said, action VFX gets me home so I can see my family at night. And I said, I'm done. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's it. Like that's, that's the goal. And I think if our sights are set at anything less than that, mm-hmm. then I think we've missed the mark. Um, and yeah, all of that comes back to the time we put in. Uh, when we show up, we show up and our team shows up. Um, and I can confidently say that, you know, we're going to make things the best that we can, the best that we know how. And then when we know better, we're going to do better. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the whole thing, uh, the whole drive behind everything at Action VFX. And it's really cool and exciting to be a part of. So thank you for allowing me in your, uh, inviting me into your van <laughs> that has cameras all the way back in 2015. Um, you know, with this five, six year mark of working together, um, yeah, I just get super nostalgic. So there's a lot of small, uh, Mm -hmm. memories, a lot of laughs packed in between. Um, but it's been a really exciting journey so far, uh, and really looking forward to the future. No, Hey, thank you for getting into my van (laughs) because (laughs) it's, it's always (laughs) funny when I think of action VFX and just this whole journey, because you know, you really was supposed to be this behind the scenes guy, right? Mm -hmm. And and I don't know if I've told you this, but definitely after the first shoot in Chicago, despite the shoot being a failure, you know, I remember us driving back to, you know, back to Tennessee and it was late at night. And, you know, I already kind of had it in the back of my mind, like, okay, okay, we're gonna make this thing work gonna figure it out and seeing that hey I did enjoy working with Luke and you know I could definitely see you know see see more of that going on and obviously there wasn't anything to really pitch yet at the time Mm because everything was very abstract but you know it's you know starting like working with you and especially when you're able to join you know before we launch like full-time and actually be part of the team Mm-hmm. It's just been crazy to just see how just just how much there is to Luke Thompson as far <laughs> as you're a very impressive individual. And I Thanks, hope I man. say that enough times because I, I appreciate that. Because even when you were mentioning of me being organized and stuff and you being impressed <laughs> with me being organized, 
you know, I think now, and it's like, no, like compared to you, as far as being able to organize things and build processes and keep things going, it's like, I may as well just be <laughs> with my hands in my pocket going, uh, what is organization and stuff? So, so hey man, right back at you. Thanks for getting in that van. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks man. I really, I really appreciate that. And yeah, like I really do feel like we have some worse stories. Like when it comes to, we've seen a lot of stuff <laughs> mm -hmm. and I think we're going to be those two old dudes that are just hanging out somewhere, driving our Teslas. And we pull up at a charging station. And then we just share some of those horror stories. Mm. And then we blast off into the sunset because our cars fly. They'll go to Mars by then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. I hope we get there way before uh, our cars go to Mars. But thank you so much, Ro. Like, I really appreciate you carving out the time uh, to chat on your own company's podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks for having me. And I don't know if I don't know if I had to twist your arm or yeah. I'm glad our schedules managed to align to yeah. make this happen. It uh, it, it worked out. Um, but yeah, any closing thoughts before I kind of wrap up? Well, I will just like to use this moment to make sure because I know this podcast was definitely focused on me and a lot of my journey from beginning to end with Action VFX, but. It's like, I can't say enough that me, like if I could have built action VFX by myself, I would have done it, <laughs> right? It's like, this is not a vision. This is not a company that was ever able to do alone, you know, you know, from you just being part of it and everything that you've done to Ronaldo PLD, who happens to also be my brother, mm -hmm. who is an awesome software engineer who helped us get the website started and still helps get the, keep the website going as far as the infrastructure of that, which mm -hmm. there is no way if I wasn't blessed with a brother who happened to be a actually talented <laughs> software engineer that, you know, this would have been possible. And then there's mm -hmm. the whole team, you know, on like in Action Vivex in the office right now. Yeah. It's... It just has been a great team effort. And at the end of the day, I'm just this guy who is lucky enough to actually lead this thing. But I never really want anyone to think this was, oh, like I just did, did this on my own. That is not the case at all. So shout out to everyone that has contributed a ton to making Action VFX a reality because we couldn't have done it without you. Yep truly mean that from the bottom of our hearts. So whether that's employees, uh, Kickstarter backers, uh, grandparents, I don't know, any, anybody <laughs> in the way. Yeah, parents, grandparents. Um, yeah, hugely, hugely beneficial. Um, awesome. Thanks so much, Ro. Uh, again, this is Rodolphe Pierre-Louis, our founder and CEO of ActionVFX.com. And this is the Ask an Artist podcast.